In this short little letter, Paul to his, to Titus, who was one of his men, you know, he was, he, uh, but Paul had a, had a team of men around him that just really served in the ministry with him. And uh, Paul was, was the elder of the group. He was the, the apostle. And these men attached themselves to him and, and would just serve with him any way they could. And, and Titus was one of those men. And Paul had left Titus on the island of Crete to, uh, to kind of instruct the churches there, you know, and, and set things in order. You know, the church was growing and they were popping up all over the place on that island. And, and he left Titus there to kind of oversee and supervise and, and appoint elders and and pastors and, and leaders in the churches, you know, and just kind of get things in order. Now, in this part of, of the letter to, to Titus here, he's just encouraging Titus to encourage the Christians to live their faith. You know, it's one thing to talk it. It's one thing to feel like, oh, in my heart, I, I, I believe. It's another thing to live it out. And he's cur- encouraging him in this passage to live it out. And it's interesting because just as he does that, he says, live your faith out. That gets him off on the grace of God. Which is interesting because it's by His grace that we live it out. Not by our good works. Do you get it? By His grace. So look what he said there. Uh, in he, picking it up in verse 4, he said, And when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards man appeared... Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. In other words, this walk that we've been called to is a walk in His grace. It's a walk in His grace. Now we defined that last week as God's loving favor towards us, which He desires to just lavish upon us, though we are totally undeserving and, and unworthy of that. That's grace. And we saw last time too that a lack in experiencing his blessing is not due to a lack of devotion. It's due to a lack of faith in his grace to you. I think a problem is we can spend our our time focusing on our duties and our failures and kind of beating ourselves up instead of just focusing on his love and his grace to you. That absolutely undeserved favor upon us. See, Paul's point here, it's about his grace. When we talk about this new life, when we talk about this new walk, we're talking, not talking about religious formality or, or rules and regulations. We're talking about His grace. <clears throat> Living in the reality of His unmerited favor and His love upon us. As undeserving as we are. Now that's what He's just exemplified. And so he goes on from there in verse 8. And with that he says this. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly, he said. I love that. There are certain truths of God's word that need to be affirmed over and over and over again. I think a lot of times they're just so wonderful that that we're we're prone to doubt them. We're, We're prone to think, well, it can't be that simple. It can't be that wonderful, you know, and, and, and we have a tendency to doubt it. And so we need constant reaffirming, constant reaffirming. I never get tired of hearing about how much God loves me individually and personally and unconditionally and eternally. I never get tired of hearing that. And I go, oh yeah, oh wonderful. You know, it, we just need 
reaffirming and reaffirming. I'll tell you one thing, and I, I've shared this in our study in Romans, that there's times I want to go back and just read Romans 8.28 again to make sure it says that. And it's really there. That, you know, God causes, you know, what is it? How does the verse go? Now I'm, I'm drawing a blank. All things work together for good. All things work together for good to those that love God and have been called according to His purpose. I'm going, what? Huh? I like to go back and say, yeah, there it is. You know, it actually says that. We need those kind of reaffirmations over and over again. We never get tired of it. Not only that, we need it. I like the way Peter put it in 2 Peter, his last letter, chapter 1, verse 12 to 15. Listen to this. For this reason, I will, not, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. You know this. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know and you don't understand and you haven't heard before. Yes, I think it right. As long as I am in this tent, he calls his body a tent. You know what's interesting about that? Tents are temporary, aren't they? A house is more permanent. A tent's temporary. And he calls that earthly body as a tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off this tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. I'm putting it in writing. I'm saying it again because I'm going to be absolutely sure that you're going to be reminded of this after I'm gone. Reminded and reminded and reminded. And that's what Paul is saying here. These things are so wonderful. These truths are so beautiful. I want you to eat Titus constantly, continually remind the brethren of these things. And going on from there, he said that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. Here's the beauty of it. Real good works. I mean, God anointed good works and living in God's love and His grace go together. They are really inseparable. You know, they, 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 they here's how he put it back in chapter 2. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us the grace of God teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. You know what he's saying there? He says, when you embrace the grace of God, and you say, man, God loves me, and he saved me, and he did 100% of that job, and I'm his. I'm an adopted child of God. He adopted me. You know, he went to the you know, the, 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 the cesspool, the pit of this world. And he said, I pick you and pulled me out and adopted me as his son. Washed me and cleansed me through Jesus and adopted me as his son. And that was purely God's grace doing that. And when I just embrace the reality of that, you know what it does? He says, that grace does a work inside you. It teaches you that God has a better way for your life. Not the, the way of ungodliness in the world, but a way that is good and it's righteous and it's wholesome and it's, it's right, you know? And here's the thing. When you embrace the grace of God and, you know, he saved me. I'm his. Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. And the Holy Spirit has done that, that renewing work in your heart that he just talked about. Then... There's a desire inside of you that you didn't have before to want to go his way. I want to go his way. You know, you didn't have that before. You want to go your way. That's radical. That's a change wrought by the Holy Spirit. That's a change, listen, wrought by receiving the grace of God. And so it's the grace of God that actually produces Real good works. God's good works. You know? So, so, with that, what he's saying here is, Christian, when he says, those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. Stay the course now. 
You know, don't lose that. Continue in that. Continue in them. Don't give up. I like the way he put it in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, when he said, And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Verse 10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. He says, you just do that. Maintain those good works. You'll reap, he said. And that reaping, brethren, is, is, is a life that's counting, that is literally bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. It's doing a work that is reverberating through the kingdom. The beautiful thing about this, brethren, any work like that has eternal ramifications. That's what he talks about reaping that fruit. You will reap if you don't grow weary. It'll happen. Good works will take place by the Spirit of God. You don't have to try to manufacture them. It's the product of just walking in that, say, maintaining that place of trust in His grace and the good works and the desire that flows from it. Hang in there. Keep it up. Walk that path. You'll reap. And that reaping, that fruit, the beauty of it has eternal ramifications. It always does. It's not just about doing a good deed to somebody here. End of story. It's about doing a good deed to somebody here in the name of Jesus Christ that reverberates through eternity. Echoes through eternity. And so he says, he's telling uh, Titus, man, tell those who are believed in God to they, they be careful to maintain those good works. And he adds, these things are good and profitable to men. God's way, with faith in him and in his love, here's the point, good and profitable, really work in life. It works. It's good and it's profitable for men. You know, and the truth that he's pointing out here is that this will be affirmed and it'll be proven out. Now listen, this is important, through life. Through life. Follow me. I've talked to some people that said, you know what, I tried one time, I tried doing it God's way one time. I had this thing, this situation, I thought, okay, I'm going to do it God's way. And as soon as I did, I just, I'm going to do it God's way, everything went south. Everything just you know, blew up. It just didn't work for me. God never guarantees that if you decide, okay, I'm going to do this God way. And if I do it God's way, you know what that means? That means God's going to bless it. It's going to work real good. Wonderful things are going to happen. I'm going to get everything I want. He never guaranteed that. He never says that. But he says, you do it. You, you, you maintain that walk. You go that way. It will it'll work out beautifully. It'll work out gloriously in the long run. You know, there was a time when I was focused on getting a commission as a lieutenant in the Marine Corps. And I was driving toward that goal. And it was my desire. And I was throwing everything into it. And then I got a knee injury. And little did I know, the afternoon I got that knee injury, that dream and that vision and everything I'd been working toward and pushing toward went flying out the window. It was gone. I could have gone, thanks a lot, God. I was a Christian at the time. I believed this is what God had for me. And the whole thing got ripped right away from me. Put me on a whole different path. I left that path, much to my sorrow, and I said, okay, well, I'm on another path now. Where did that path lead? Led to a young lady named Joyce that became my wife for life, and it led to a call in the ministry to serve Jesus with the rest of my life. I don't know where the other one would have led me, but I, would have, I, I, I know one thing. I would have ended up in Vietnam as a second lieutenant, trudging through the jungles of of Vietnam 
and uh, life expectancy of second lieutenants weren't very good in Vietnam. But the Lord put me on another path. Brethren, Paul makes it very clear. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what the will of God is, or that the will of God is good and acceptable and perfect. That's what the will of God is. It's good, it's acceptable and perfect. You may prove it out in your life over the long haul. God made a promise. Jeremiah 29, 11, my son David's favorite verse in all the Bible. God said, I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. And so, brethren, that's, that's simply the result of saying, God, I want your way for my life. And in, in, in the context of what he's saying here in, in Titus, maintaining good works which simply means depending on his grace and saying, Lord, use me according to your will. You know, because real good works are the work of God's grace through you, not your righteousness or righteous works. So, brethren, discovering what that is, what that, that good will plan Blessing is, is a, is the adventure of life. Okay, Lord, where are we going? You see? <clears throat> so, with that, he said, these things are good and they're profitable to men. He goes on in verse 9, but avoid foolish disputes genealogies, contentions, and striving about the law, arguing about points of the law. What are we supposed to do? What are we not supposed to do? What is God, you know, and, and, and contentions and striving and disputing, for they are unprofitable and useless. He had just described what is good and profitable, and now he's describing what is unprofitable and useless. He's, he's, he's doing the, the contrast to that. And he says, you know, avoid that, uh, all, you know, all of those uh, meaningless arguments and discussions and everything he describes here is sort of on a religious level, you know? People can, uh, can get off on the most amazing, crazy tangents, you know? And, 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 and just get engrossed in these in these little arguments and tangents about religion or, or about the Bible or something like that. I mean, he talks about genealogies here. I mean, the Mormon church has spent tens of millions of dollars and tens of millions of man hours working on genealogies so they can be baptized for the dead. You know, it's, what a waste that is. And there's, there's another group out there that, that wants to prove that Anglo-Saxons are the ten lost tribes of Israel. And they've just, you know, they've been over backwards to, you know, to try to make a case for that. What a, what a waste of time. You know, these disputes and these contentions. That some people simply want to bait you into an argument just to, just to debate and argue points like that. And uh, he's saying, beware of that. And some can be so silly. I remember a college professor that his argument for disproving the God of the Bible is that the Bible says God is uh, all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-powerful. Well, and he can do anything. He can do anything. That means he could, he could create a rock bigger than he could pick up. But if he couldn't pick it up, he can't do everything. You see? So therefore, I've disproved the God of the Bible. That is just downright silly. That's one of the stupidest things I ever heard. You know? And he says, 
Avoid that kind of thing. I remember as a young pastor, I was walking down the street, and this little old lady was walking by. And I don't know how we even got on the discussion. Hi, you know, it's just the street. I was going way, she was going the other way. It was just the two of us. And I, maybe I was carrying my Bible or something. It caught her attention. So she wanted to talk about it. Well, it didn't take me long to realize this lady was a card-carrying Jehovah's Witness. And so we, we were standing there on the corner, and we were talking and debating for hours. I mean, hours. I was standing there trying to talk to this lady about the Bible, about Scripture, about Jesus, uh, you know, about faith, and all that kind of stuff. And I would say probably three hours later, I got nowhere. I think, what in the world was that about? So God has a word for us about those kinds of things. Here's God's word to us. He goes on there and he says, verse 10, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped. <laughs> They're warped. That's biblical. That person's warped. And sinning, being self-condemned. Well, that's God's word on the subject. You know, it's like, it's like you run across somebody like this and you're not sure where they're coming from and so you talk to them and you share with them and you maybe see where, you're, where they're coming from. No, 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 that's not quite right. You know, and, and, and you give it to them as straight as you can give it to them and they, they want to argue the point or something and you, know, you just say, well, you know, some other time, and maybe you see, you know, try it again, time to warn them once more again. But if all they're doing, if, if nothing's being, you know, connecting and everything, and all they want to do is just sort of argue the point, then shine them on. Forget it. Let them go. Don't re refuse to become a part of that. Nope. Sorry, not going to talk to you anymore about that, about that stuff. That's God's word on the subject. Basically, he's saying it's a waste of time. You won't change them, and uh, you, you end up spending a lot of time that could use, be used so much better in another way. You know, sometimes um, I think some of these people are literally plants of the enemy to just distract you and eat up your time when God has something better for you to do. And you're thinking, well, I'm talking about the Lord but you're talking to a contentious person that just wants to debate and argue religion. And the Lord says, turn that one off. I like the way, I, I like what, what uh, we're told at the end of the book of Revelation. Chapter 22, last chapter, verse 11. This statement is made. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. You know what I think he's saying is um, the time is short. Time is short, move on. You know, don't get, don't get stuck. It's not our job to change them. It's simply to share with them the truth. You know, any time I've been in a situation where you know, I've shared the truth. It's pretty immediately clear whether it's going to be received and an interest sparked in it or not. You know, whether they just want to argue or they're just going to tune you out or something like that. Pretty clear. You know what he's saying here? The time is so short. The end is coming so quickly. Don't hassle that. Move on. Jesus said to his disciples when he sent them out, if a town doesn't receive you, just wipe the dust off your feet and go to the next town. Don't waste your time there. So, we're not to waste time arguing and debating this. We're called just to share it. And he said there, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning and being self-condemned. They're simply condemning themselves. And you look at that, and you know, you look at that, man, that's sad. But it's reality. He says, yeah, this is reality. So with that, that kind of says, that's what I've got to say here. And then he, he, he wraps up this book with his concluding remarks, like he does more on a personal level. level. So in verse 12, he says, uh, when I send Artemis to you, or 
Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. So we, we know nothing about this guy Artemis other than what is said right here. Obviously, one of Paul's men working with him because he puts him in the same category as Tychicus. And Tychicus, we know from other places. I mean, he was the guy when Paul was in prison at the end of Acts that Paul gave the letters to Ephesians and Colossians to take to those people. He was the courier that took those letters to those people. So he was, you know, he was one of Paul's men, you know, uh, doing, uh, helping out in the ministry like that. So he's saying, uh, I'm either going to send Tychicus or I'm going to send Artemis to you in Crete. And apparently he's going to send them there to relieve Titus, you know, and kind of take over that work. And he wants Titus to come back to him. And whether he's in Nicopolis right at that point or he's going to be there, you know, for the winter, he's going to get there for the winter, we don't know. But that's in Greece, that's a city in Greece. And he's going to, you know, he's asking Titus, you know, come back, Titus, and, and meet me there. On, you know, I, I want to hook up with you there in Nicopolis. So join me there. And he says in verse 13, send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos. Uh, you know, this is the only lawyer that's ever mentioned in Scripture as being a disciple of Jesus. I don't know what that means, but I just thought I would point it out. Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey with haste that they may lack nothing. So these men apparently were visiting in Creek there. Now we know Apollos, we don't know much about Zenos, but Apollos, he pops up in the New Testament. And he was a guy that actually Priscilla and Aquila had met Paul in, in Corinth when Paul was ministering there. And when Paul went back to Jerusalem, uh, Aquila and Priscilla and Aquila went over to Ephesus. And when they were in Ephesus, this Apollos guy showed up. And what a dynamic speaker and, and, and a convincing a servant of, of, of the word of God he was. And as a religion, this guy is powerful and he's talking about the Messiah and it's really great. But they begin to realize, I don't think he knows the Messiah's come. He's sort of talking like John the Baptist. And, and it, I don't think he knows about Jesus. So when, when they had a chance, they took him aside and they shared about Jesus with Apollos. Apollos going, really? Apollos got saved, you know? on fire for Christ, and he went out from there, and now he had the full story, and he became this dynamic, powerful preacher. He was an evangelist. He was an apologist. He, you know, he knew he was so versed in Scripture, in the Old Testament like that, and now it came alive with Jesus. Man, he was, uh, he was proclaiming Jesus from the pages of the Old Testament powerfully. And then it says there that at one point he wanted to go over to Corinth, you know. And, of course, uh, Priscilla and Aquila had been there. And, and so he said, I, I want to go over to Corinth. And they said, oh, that would be great. That body over there would love you. And so the church there in Ephesus sent letters of recommendation, you know. But this guy's great, man. Receive him there in Corinth. And, and he went to Corinth. And, man, did he bless the body in Corinth. And the thing that impressed them the most, because they we're learning to live in the grace of God. And of course, Judaism is, very, is a very legalistic religious system. And, and it says of him regarding his time in Corinth in Acts 18, 28, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. He was a, he, he, he was a great apologist. That's Apollos. And so basically what Paul is saying, hey, Zenos and Apollos, are there visiting you? Take care of them. Receive them. And, you know, they've got a lot of work to do for the Lord. They're just passing through. They're going to move on. Help them on their way. Make sure their needs are taken care of and everything. So, so that was the word. You know what's interesting about this? Paul is an apostle here. Man, he's just laying out instructions here, isn't he? I want them to go there, and I want you to do that, and you to go like that, you know, and things like that. But he was, he was doing this to men who had committed their lives to just serving. We're just going to serve. What do you need to do? 
What needs to happen? We're here to serve. Let me tell you something about Paul. Paul was not a taskmaster. Paul wasn't one that just barked out instructions to people. We know that to be the case. When we look at Philemon, we'll see an example of it in Philemon. But even regarding Apollos, earlier in his letter uh, to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, he said in chapter 16, verse 12, right at the end of that letter, those personal notes. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. So he wasn't ordering Apollos to go there. He's saying, Apollos, I'd love you to go with the guys. And Apollos said, not now. And Paul received that. Okay. Well, you know, he's telling the people there he, uh, he will come when he can. His leadership was based on the willing submission of those who were working with him. Brethren, it was uh, what, that's the way authority, listen, the authority in the body of Christ operates. It's the willingness of the servants, not the demands of the person in charge or in control. Or a leader. What? Praise the Lord for those who are willing just to serve the Lord as needed. You know, uh, what, what a blessing to the body of Christ. Those folks are gifts and blessings to the body. I can tell you. <clears throat> not, not questioning everything. Not challenging. Not criticizing. Just here I am, how can I serve? Let me serve. I'm not here to judge this. I'm here to serve. What can I do? The enemy would have us have a lot of complaints about each other. Especially leadership. But brethren, you know, unless a person is being doctrinally off base, unscriptural, or there's immorality in his life. Those two things aside, let him lead. Let him serve the Lord. Just say, what can I do to help? God's in control. God's bigger. I don't think he's doing it right. Well, let God handle that. You know, um, in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 13, verse 17, obey those who rule over you, and that's, that's in the body of Christ, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. You know? So Paul's dealing with people here that are just saying, how can we serve? Just show us how we can serve. Paul feels very free about it. Here's what I'd like you guys to do. We're there. Kind of the attitude, you know? Now, here's the thing. Actually, brethren, that's the way the Lord leads us. In exactly that way. We are called to be his bond servants. You know what a bond servant is? A bond servant is somebody who has surrendered himself and made himself willing to be the absolute servant and slave of that person that he's serving. It's like in the Old Testament when, when, when somebody who has been a servant or a slave in a household and their time of service is up, he comes and says, I don't want to leave. I want to be your servant the rest of my life. I want to give my life to serve this house and this home the rest of my life. And, and they, would, they would take an owl, you know, and they would put a, they'd pierce his ear and put a ring in, in that ear and that would be an indication that this person is a bond servant of that house and, and of his master. He has chosen to do that. That's what God calls from us. He doesn't force his authority on any of us. He invites us to serve him. And we do it as, as willing servants of his. And so that's where... That, that's where that submission comes into the Lord. And once you can truly come to that place of submission to the Lord, it's so much easier to come into a place of submission to one another. 
And you know, in the Word, he doesn't talk about, wives, you've got to submit to your husband, or, or you must submit to your leaders as much as he talks about submitting to one another in the fear of God. Have a heart of just, you, you're submitted to the Lord. It's so easy to submit to one another. And, and so that's what he calls us to. It's interesting, you know, when Jesus gave this word to his disciples in, in uh, Luke 9, 23, he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. That's just sacrificing yourself and follow me. Follow me. Think about that. Follow me. You know, if somebody is making you do something or go somewhere, they're behind you. Maybe they've got a gun in your back or something and say, okay, go this way, go that way. But they're behind you to make sure you do what they want you to do. Jesus doesn't say, doesn't get, call you to get in front of him so he can push you around. He says, here I go, follow me. And one thing about following, it's voluntary. You can say, follow me. This has happened to me. And let's go. And, you know, I go a little ways down the road and I look around and where'd everybody go? <laughs> you know? <clears throat> but Jesus said, you follow me. That's the spirit of the exercise of authority. It begins right with the Lord in the body of Christ. And so... So he's, you know, Paul is, is just, you know, laying out instructions to people that want to just say, what, what needs to be done here? I'll do it, you know? And so with that, he says in verse 14, kind of summing it all up, and let our people also learn to maintain good works, there it is again, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. It's like Paul wants all those believers to be fruitful in their spiritual life, in their spiritual walk. Fruitful for the Lord. You know, it's God's will for us to be fruitful. To, you know, there'd, there'd be spiritual fruit in our lives as a result of our lives and everything. In fact... Fruit bearing is important. Fruit bearing is vital in the Christian life and the Christian walk. Listen to this. Jesus' words to his disciples in John 15, 1 and 2. I'm the vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And he says down in verse 5 of that chapter, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. You sort of get the importance that, hey, you know, fruit in this thing is kind of important. It's sort of an indicator of, of, of somebody that's serious about their faith and their walk with the Lord, you know? It, you know, when Jesus uh, was going into Jerusalem there that during the Passion Week and there was that fig tree that he saw that was very leafy, but it had no fruit. And remember, he goes up to it at one point, he's looking through it and everything. There's not a, a bit of fruit. He curses the fig tree. A lot of leaves, no fruit. They come back that evening and the thing's already withered. And uh, Whoa, that was quick. But you know, that was, we know, was a picture of Israel. And he was simply describing what Israel had become. It had become a lot of leaves, a lot of religiosity, no fruit. And he says, if there's no fruit, it's cursed. And indeed, Israel for a great deal of time has, in a sense, been under that curse of God, but God hasn't forgotten them. And God's reviving them in the last days. Spiritually, it's coming. There was, he told a parable in Luke 13 about a fig tree in a vineyard that was bearing no fruit. And the master said, cut that tree down. It's just taken up space. Third year, by this time there should be fruit, no fruit. Cut it down. And the, and the keeper of the vineyard said, master, let me, 
let's give another year. Let, 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 let me dig around it and, and fertilize and water and, and, and just really do everything I can for there to be fruit. And, and then if there's fruit, great. But, but if not, uh, after next year, then, then okay, we'll just go ahead and just cut it down. And again, sort of a picture of Israel. But the point is, brethren, God's plan and purpose for us is to be fruit bearing. It's part of, it's part of our walk and our life with him. Fruit bearing. Jesus told his disciples, you will know them, how? By their fruit. You know? So the point he's making here and the point he makes in Scripture some point he makes in John 15. He says, you don't manufacture the fruit. You don't produce it. You walk with him. And he bears the fruit through you. It's his work. You know what that means? It's by his grace. Working in your life. The idea here is you carry on in your walk Trusting the Lord as a servant of His, knowing that that's what, what, what you are. Listen, by His grace, there will be fruit. He'll do it. I like again what he said in, in Galatians chapter 6. Listen to this. Listen to it again. 6, 7, and 9. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows... That he will also reap. For the one who sows to the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And so the Lord is saying, trust me. My plan for your life. I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. Trust my grace upon you. And there will be fruit. And that will be though that indication. Yeah, 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 yeah. God is good. God's working. You know, it's just... <clears throat> and God doesn't show you all the fruit. But he will show you here and there a little glimpse. Yeah, there is some fruit. There is some fruit there. <clears throat> so with that, verse 15, and we finish Titus. All who are with me greet you. There's those greetings, remember Sunday? Greet those who love us in the faith. And then he ends as he ends almost virtually all of his letters, grace be with you all. There it is again. He started with grace. He ends with grace. Grace be with you, every single one of you, all. Amen. You know what I like about that? Grace be with you. That's a present tense. That's a happening thing right now. Today, grace here, grace now, grace today be upon you and with you. You know, it's the unmerited favor, the help, the support of God with you on a daily basis. His grace is sufficient right now. That grace. Amen. Amen. Good news. I love what he says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. When he says, therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor, your labor, is not in vain in the Lord. It's fruit bearing. It counts. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for 
that beautiful little letter that the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote your veritable and very word, your living word, to that young servant, Titus, which is, reverberates through the centuries to every servant of yours in every age, in every place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name, our Lord. This is a good life you have called us to. Hallelujah. Amen.